Hello and welcome to the Inside Social Work podcast, a podcast that aims to inspire, engage and connect social workers with other social workers and allied health professionals doing interesting and amazing things across the world. I'm your host, Marie Vakakis. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. special return guest Caroline Burrows. Caroline was with us on the podcast back in 2020. I was going to say 2000 but no 2020. So a couple of years ago um, on episode 29 where she explained uh, what EMDR is and helped us demystify a little bit about what that is. EMDR has been a very popular topic and a lot of people have been looking to learn a little bit more about it, what it is and how they can get trained. And so I thought I'd have Caroline back on the podcast to explain a little bit more to us about briefly what EMDR is uh, and how can you become trained as an EMDR practitioner, what settings EMDR can be used in, um, the kinds of things EMDR can help with and what other modalities can you incorporate with EMDR. So if you're already trained in DBT or ACT or CBT, she talks about how you can integrate all of those into EMDR. It's a really interesting modality. Um, It's been increasing in popularity at the moment, which is really exciting to see people talking about the different treatment options for post-traumatic stress in particular, as well as a number of other negative life experiences um, and processing different sorts of difficult and distressing memories. MDR is definitely an area of growth. And you can uh, click on the show notes. Caroline has some information about upcoming events and training that she offers uh, in her basic training, as well as some um, higher advanced training in specific areas of EMDR, like working with parts or case conceptualization, which I've done a few and they're really great. And those of you who have been listening, I hope you've enjoyed the last few solo episodes on supervision. There'll be another one coming up next week. And I just wanted to remind you all that I do have some online group supervision for social workers and school counsellors, or social workers in schools, uh, those who work with uh, adolescents, so in high schools, small groups, uh, really valuable to network with other social workers and to get the experience of a number of people in the group, as well as present some tricky cases or some situations or things that you find difficult in those environments. Uh, As someone who's worked in schools myself, I know it can be incredibly isolating. They are some of the best jobs that I've had, but also sometimes the most difficult in terms of that professional identity. So I wanted to help provide a space for other social workers and school counsellors to feel connected to people in their field and to learn from each other. So click in the links in the show notes, there'll be some information to that, or you can check out my website at thetherapyhub.com.au and there'll be a tab there for supervision. All right, no more of me chattering on. Here is my interview with Caroline Burrows. A little bit about Caroline. Um, Caroline's an accredited EMDR trainer and consultant with a background in clinical social work and psychotherapy. And she has over 15 years of experience providing therapeutic services across community, hospital, medical and tertiary, so university settings. She's the owner and director of Mindful Living, a group private practice in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, She had uh, worked in... um, Melbourne Clinic. So as an EMDR coordinator of the Melbourne Clinic, she developed the first inpatient hospital EMDR program in Victoria. Um, And she has an infectious enthusiasm for EMDR therapy and EMDR training, which will be obvious um, when you listen to her talk about it. Uh, She loves encouraging and motivating uh, mentoring therapists as they embrace opportunities uh, that EMDR therapy brings So for a bit more information about Caroline, you can head over to her website, uh, carolineburrows.com.au, and there's a link to that in the show notes. I hope you enjoy my interview today with Caroline Burrows. Today I have a return guest, Caroline Burrows. Welcome back, Caroline. Thank you for having me, Marie. 
So we had a bit of a chat around demystifying EMDR, and I'll pop a link to that in the show notes for those who haven't listened. But could you briefly just share a little bit about who you are and what EMDR is really briefly, because we'll direct people to that other episode. So my name is Caroline Burrows and my background is in social work and psychotherapy. I've been working in the mental health profession in Melbourne for about 16 years now. And my primary focus in the last decade has been EMDR therapy and EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And this is a trauma-based psychotherapy or a form of, of therapy that we use with people who have experienced life events that have been painful and are continuing to impact on their present. And so my background originally was in counselling and, and psychotherapy. These days, I spend a lot more time providing training and consultation to mental health professionals. I'm an accredited EMDR trainer, so I deliver a lot of training to folk who are learning EMDR for the first time. I'm also really passionate about upskilling and mentoring EMDR therapists as they continue their learning journey. And I provide a lot of professional consultation and supervision to mental health professionals more generally. I'm the director of a private practice in Melbourne called Mindful Living in Croydon, where we have a special focus on EMDR. So in a nutshell, EMDR is a method of therapy that's based on the idea that the brain has an innate natural capacity to heal, just like the body does. And that when we experience really painful or significant life events, that that capacity to heal or to resolve that experience can get interrupted and it can get stuck, so to speak, and impact on the person long after it's over. So that can be things like nightmares, flashbacks, um, low self-worth, difficulty trusting people, not feeling safe, for example. And in EMDR therapy, we're utilising something called bilateral stimulation, which is typically eye movements, to activate the brain in a way to help that person work through and resolve those key life events that are impacting on them so that they no longer have that effect and that person experiences um, a real transformation in their symptoms and in their life difficulties. Excellent. So um, hopefully people caught that. <laughs> and you very um, you describe things that when I hear, when we talk about EMDR, we often refer to tra traumatic memories, but you were talking about negative experiences or disturbing experiences. So could you tell the audience a little bit around how we conceptualize trauma and how that can be um, subjective or even made up of things that maybe wouldn't be um, considered traumatic by someone else. Like it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a therapy that can be used for a number of different presentations and not just trauma. That's right. So when it was first developed in the late 1980s, it was originally designed for post-traumatic stress disorder and particularly single incident trauma. So what we consider big T traumas like a life-threatening event. And since that time, it's evolved quite significantly. And there's now a lot of ways in which it's modified to support people who have experienced a range of, of, of painful or what we consider adverse life events. So we say the little T traumas that have accumulated, not just those big T life-threatening events. So little T traumas are really common to all of us. Most of us will have had some experiences, a painful breakup or a job redundancy or bullying or feeling like we were inadequate in some way and these experiences tend to accumulate and shape the way we see ourselves the way that we see ourselves in regard to others and the way that we feel about the world and how we move about in the world and EMDR therapy has a, a very wide ranging applicability across a range of different issues. Really, if there's a link between the current concern that a person has, for example, low self-confidence and past experiences in that person's life, such as having a, a painful breakup um, or having a, a parent that was very critical, for example, EMDR can certainly address those issues. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad that you you said that because I've been working with someone even just as early as this week where they were almost dismissing their own experiences because it felt it felt to them almost silly that something that happened. And I think I'm using an example of like grade four, you know, a, a teacher's response to a piece of work that that person produced, and that's the only thing they can remember from that whole year. But that was a really big piece that informed a larger idea that they're not good enough and that they're stupid. 
yeah and, and so think- we're using emdr like we did the we did mapping and we're using emdr it's not necessarily a trauma like if they talked about it to a friend someone would be like we'll just get over it that's stupid um but for that person that was one of half a dozen key moments in their life that have led to this belief that's impacting them in their job as a as an adult now mm. That's right. And I think it's also really important to remember that often it's not just what happens to us in life, but it's what doesn't happen. So particularly when we're kids, if we have had an absence of emotional attunement or an absence of praise or an absence of emotional support, then we're likely to develop beliefs about ourselves and our capacity to self-soothe and our capacity to express emotion is going to be impacted as well. So EMDR can also be modified to, to address some of those experiences that, that may be hard to pin down, but just those key moments um, or those moments that may have happened many, many times, such as I had a client once where the, the focus that we were working on in EMDR was this particular eye roll that her mum would do. So when she would try to show her mum a piece of schoolwork or try to express some enthusiasm about an idea, her mum would just roll her eyes and feel really, seem really disinterested. Now, mum may have had other things going on, of course, but for that person, they developed this idea over the course of time that, that I don't matter, I'm not important. And so that image of mum's eye roll was actually what we call a target for EMDR. That was a focal point that we could address. Yeah, excellent. And we'll talk a little bit more about how different modalities fit with EMDR. But if we go back to the start, um, how can someone learn to be an EMDR um, therapist uh, and what kind of qualifications or experience do they need if they were interested? A person needs to be a mental health professional. Now that's not just a psychologist, that can be a range of different professional backgrounds. So it could be a psychologist, an occupational therapist, a social worker, a counsellor, a psychotherapist, a nurse, a GP, a psychiatrist. However, the person does need to have had some mental health training specifically. So from time to time, we might train a GP, for example, but they do need to have had some mental health training in addition to their medical training. When it comes to being a a mental health professional beyond that, um, the EMDR Association of Australia does have some training eligibility requirements that can be found on their website, which is emdraa.org. And it includes things like being registered with um, APRA, the um, Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, if you are um, eligible to be registered with APRA, and if not, to be under the auspice of a professional uh, association, such as as a social worker, I'm a member of the Australian Association of Social Workers, for example. So you do need to be linked to a regulatory body or a professional body of some sort. And there are a few other little um, criteria points as well that are beyond the scope of, of this discussion, um, just things like the level of, of, of membership um, for counsel at psychotherapists, for example, if they um, have um, not been um, registered with, say, APRA because they're not under that um, auspice. So there's a few little extra tidbits to have a look at on the MDRA website, the EMDR Association of Australia. But in a nutshell, a person who's men, um, a mental health trained professional, and it also suggests that somebody that has some basic skill already in working with trauma because EMDR therapy is is an advanced trauma therapy it's 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 not just um, talking about one's problems and and that kind of thing it's actually directly addressing a person's really painful life experiences so being able to hold a client with confidence and be able to support somebody when they're distressed and be able to provide education about the impact of trauma for example are all really basic prerequisites to doing EMDR therapy safely with a client. Yeah, that's a really good um, thing to mention because it's not an introductory um, counselling skill-based practice. So uh, mm-hmm. you have to have already skills in building rapport, starting, your, like actually just, yeah, holding that space. Um, and for those who, I mean, being on the social Inside Social Work podcast, you don't have to be an accredited mental health social worker. So this can be one of the trainings that you add to build up that uh, focus psychological strategies but you do need that experience of having it started working with individuals in this way, in this capacity. That's all correct. Wonderful. So you've mentioned a whole range of different professionals. So maybe this question is kind of answered in that, but what kinds of settings can EMDR therapy be used in? Um, So I know when I did training, it's been used for that short-term single incident trauma 
abroad. So kind of fly in, fly out services. I know we use it in our, um, in my private practice, you know, in telehealth and in with individuals and sometimes in family and couples therapy as well. What are other settings that people might not have considered um, that they can use EMDR therapy with? So I developed an intensive inpatient EMDR program at a psychiatric hospital. And and so I had the pleasure of working with people who were in inpatient. So they were staying in the hospital for a planned admission. So not a crisis admission. They'd come in for a month and we do quite intensive multiple sessions a week plus group therapy. So that's another example of the type of setting where it can be done. So an inpatient hospital setting, typically it would be offered in an outpatient counselling type of environment. But that can take place in private practices, it can take place in community organisations, public health, it can really be um, utilised in a range of different settings. And I really like that you mentioned that it doesn't just have to be used with individual clients, even though typically that's the context in which trauma therapy takes place. There are certainly some ways in which it can be utilised in a um, in a more systemic way with families and with couples. And certainly, as you mentioned, also when it comes to humanitarian uh, disasters or where there's recent events, there can actually even be some group based protocols Um, for example when there's been um, floods there have been teams that have gone say to Lismore and and done some work with um, a group of people as far as I'm aware so there's really a a very wide range of of scope for how this can be used. Excellent I've also seen um, people use it in schools I know that sometimes in schools people think that this is for some reason they think this is a weird type of therapy but it's just as valid and just as suitable as using CBT or ACT or any other therapeutic modality. So if you're using those already, there's no reason why you couldn't use this. That's right. I think EMDRs always have this sort of mystical aspect because of the <laughs> curious eye movements. Uh, but it's so exciting now that it is recognised as a Medicare-focused psychological strategy. So it means that it is, is much more mainstream these days. And uh, we now in my practice routinely get referrals from GPs and psychiatrists for this treatment. And the fact that it's now been rolled out, as I mentioned before, across hospitals and other settings, I mean, it's just so exciting. So, And Prince Harry has had EMDR therapy and he spoke to Oprah about this and so it's really just gotten enormous visibility and and, and coverage in the last couple of years and I wonder that's an interesting um, comment because we did see an increase of inquiries and I wonder if sometimes it's because EMDR is it's unique in terms that it uses a bilateral stimulation that maybe it's one of the few therapies that people can actually name so they might not know that they're receiving a different type of other therapy to promote it in that same way. So it's very, it's less likely someone's going to say, you know, I've been doing ACT or CBT or maybe schema, they probably would know. But I feel like there are so many other therapies as well that um, we could talk about that people just don't know that that's what, like they, it's really hard to say. I'm receiving interpersonal psychotherapy. <laughs> like it's, it's less I, um, recognized. That That's right. No, I couldn't agree more. So how can, How can EMDR help in the way that, like, what makes it different to other therapeutic modalities? Hmm. I often use with clients a metaphor of an iceberg. So if you think about the tip of an iceberg or what you see above the surface of the water, that's what we can what we can visibly see: symptoms, and behavioral difficulties, addictive, you know, issues, whatever it might be that the person is coming in to therapy to address. And then underneath the surface of the water is the, the, the deeper unseen experiences. Now, I'm not suggesting EMDR is the only therapy that does this because it certainly isn't. There are other trauma processing models, but I think. EMDR does tend to go below the surface of the water, so to speak. So there are um, phases within EMDR therapy where we certainly do address the tip of the iceberg. So building a client's capacity to cope with distressing emotions and and what we call resourcing the clients or building up their their, their, um, internal capacity to cope. But really what we're doing in EMDR is going deeper. We're really making that link between the current day issues and the past experiences, as well as present day triggers and future concerns that the person is wanting to address. And so it's really that deeper transformative therapy. And what we're also doing in EMDR is we're 
relying on the brain's natural innate capacity to heal. And so, yes, it's a structured therapy where the, the therapist is guiding the client and the client's obviously doing incredible work. However, there really is this, this idea of stepping out of the way a little bit and actually just trusting the brain's capacity to process that experience or the memory that you're working on. And so that's why it's actually quite different to other therapies where there's less of this direct attempt to try to challenge thoughts, for example. It's more about being able to call something into conscious awareness and notice what's coming up. So thoughts and feelings and sensations that accompany that memory and then allowing the brain's natural processing system to get up and running with these bilateral eye movements and just trusting the process. So I think it's in a way less of a directive sort of therapy, even though it's very structured. It's less of that direct attempt to try to challenge or to change. It's more about allowing an organic processing to take place. And really is it is about getting to the bottom of, of current symptoms. So, so the, 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 the root cause of those issues rather than simply managing um, or responding to, to symptoms in the present. Yeah, that's a really great explanation. And we talk about a lot in the first interview that we did around the different phases. Um, and I think people maybe don't realize that those first few phases before you're actually doing the reprocessing can be really therapeutic and healing in themselves because you're still building capacity for, you know, to regulate, to calm down. And you know, I was working with someone recently and doing some memory mapping talking about things that they had never spoken about before was actually starting to dissolve some of the shame. And so it'll be curious when we revisit those memories um, to process if they're actually not as strong because some of them were actually just linked to feelings of shame and just actually mapping them out and talking about the impact that those had might have been therapeutic enough without needing to reprocess. Has that mm. been your experience as well, that maybe people misunderstand that the phases that leading up to the reprocessing are very therapeutic and, and you know, supporting people to recover from those negative life experiences in itself? Yeah, that, that's very consistent with my experience. And I think the other thing just to note about EMDR is that it's based on this underpinning model called the adaptive information processing model, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it essentially just means that the brain has this natural capacity to adaptively resolve experiences and to work toward um, you know, integrating experiences and, and to, to heal, essentially. So what we're doing in those early phases in EMDR is we're not only identifying what have been some of the quote unquote failures in adaptive information processing, i.e. what memories have not been adequately resolved by the brain and need to be targeted, but we're also assessing what adaptive information and resources does the client organically have so we're not just coming in and teaching new skills we're actually in EMDR wanting to really harness the existing strengths that the client has so we might do some work around identify what positive experiences has that person had in their life what key attachments have been really supportive what resources do they have and so it's about what evidence is there of adaptive information processing as well as some of those areas of concern that we need to address because those resources are going to be just profoundly therapeutic in and of themselves so supporting a client to have that awareness that they do have a lot of innate resilience and strength is very powerful and also those resources are useful when we come to process the more painful um, so to speak, maladaptively stored memories that have not been resolved by the brain naturally. Uh, those resources are incredibly important for that. Yeah, and that really flows in perfectly to my next question, which, you know, it, it's very, your enthusiasm and excitement for EMDR is, is very obvious. And if you, um, if people follow you on any of the socials, they'll see that excitement. It's um, unparalleled, really. But what other modalities does it work well with? So EMDR therapy in itself um, really actually pulls on other things like to, to do that, some of that containment and those resourcing, they then rely on often other techniques and, and therapy therapies. Um, so what are some of the ones that work well with EMDR in your experience? Absolutely. Look, I think it's important to note that EMDR really is a synthesis of a range of other different therapeutic approaches. It has cognitive behavioural aspects. It has exposure-based elements. It has mindfulness-based elements. There's a range of different things that it draws on. In my experience, um, I find that it integrates beautifully with a range of other therapies. And so examples might be in the early phases in EMDR therapy where we are preparing a client to feel strong enough and, and confident to be able to process their painful memories. We might utilise 
across some DBT skills, dialectical behavioural therapy skills, to build their capacity to tolerate distress and to be able to regulate emotions. Certainly schema therapy that you mentioned before can be incredibly helpful in the assessment phase in helping the person to understand sort of how those core beliefs have developed in their life and also some of the what we call schema mode work, which is working with some of the internal, I suppose, parts or aspects of that particular person are other forms of ego state therapy internal family systems as an example um, is also um, you know highly applicable to emdr2 and it goes without saying that cbt and um, has its relevance as well in emdr therapy there are three time periods that we address we've spoken a lot today about the past prong as we call it in EMDR but we also deal with any residual present day concerns or triggers once we've dealt with the past and also future anticipated concerns and as part of that present and future fo focused work in EMDR we often integrate EMDR with other cognitive behavioral approaches things like um, uh, behavioral experiments you know like trying something new that you might have been avoiding things like graded exposure to be able to start to step towards situations that you feared things like being able to learn new skills, boundaries, communication skills, assertiveness. An example might be a person who's had a, a sexual assault experience, wants to process that experience and dealt with any residual triggers in the present, like, for example, a particular smell or sound. We might then look to the future. Well, how would you like to be stepping into your future? The person might say, well, look, I'd love to start dating, but I'm really anxious about that. So not only would we process some of those fears using EMDR, but we'd also utilise some of those other approaches that I just mentioned around learning assertiveness skills, boundary setting, how they can start to take small steps in a safe way toward achieving their goals. And look, I love ACT as well, acceptance, commitment therapy, and I do think that ACT is, is beautifully woven throughout most therapies that focus on values and, and taking steps toward living a really meaningful, fulfilling life, skills like diffusing or unhooking yourself from thoughts that are really painful and unhelpful. They're all relevant and helpful at each phase in EMDR. I think you're, um, the way you explained it is really beautiful because it gives people a bit of a, an idea that it, it no, no one technique suits everybody and you do need to have a few um, and they can work actually really well together. And sometimes a client just really connects with the language of one or an analogy of one and that just might be what they prefer. So I think it's really good to have quite a few up your belt. I agree. So, I mean, the next question was going to be, do you have to only use EMDR? But I think you kind of captured that, that it encompasses a range of different therapeutic techniques and you could get through the first few phases and then the client might decide that they don't want to reprocess. They're actually quite happy with, with that, with it stopping it there. That's, that's correct. And, and look, to be honest, I don't think it's helpful to be a purist. I mean, I think that, that all of these therapies, uh, they don't exist in a vacuum as far as I'm concerned. I think they're, they're well integrated in, 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 in um, a lot of ways. And I think even though the EMDR framework and that adaptive information processing model, which is that underpinning theory or model of EMDR, that may well be the framework that I use in my therapy. So when I'm formulating or conceptualizing the client situation and discerning how I might approach the case, I really am looking at it through this lens, but I'm drawing on other therapies along the way. And in all seriousness, I think we're all influenced by many therapies, whether we want to admit it or not, you know, um, things like cognitive behavioral therapy. I know, I know some people might have sort of stepped away from that and feel that there's other things that might be a little more um, enticing to them these days, not to suggest that a lot of people don't still use CBT, but you do hear a bit of rhetoric around there's been a bit of movement since mm. some of those earlier days with CBT was very, very heavily emphasised. However, I think we're all influenced by that, whether it be teaching relaxation skills to a client, whether it be taking steps toward, you know, exposure toward things that were previously avoided, um, you know, activity scheduling and behavioural activation and helping a person to start to take steps toward increasing meaningful activities in their life. You know, these are things we all do. So um, I think we're all utilising different therapies in our work um, and EMDR is no different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you also run on-demand training for um, different, I guess, not components of EMDR, but sort of different topics. So, you know, I know I've done some of your training looking at sort of like attachment and EMDR, and there are a number of different ways that um, people can add on to their EMDR training. So after they've done level one, they can then do some of these other sort of more specialized or um, specific trainings. Uh, or when they've done their level two, or just when you know a pre presentation comes across you that you want to th learn a bit more about. So, what other sorts of um, topics, I guess, 
can people learn about after their basic training? Yeah, absolutely. So on my website, I have a range of different on-demand trainings, and that ranges from everything from EMDR for depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, addictions, eating disorders, uh, case conceptualization in EMDR, troubleshooting, working with parts. I think that's by far my most popular training uh, is integrating EMDR therapy when working with a person's internal parts of self. So not necessarily just dissociative parts, but ego states. We all have parts. And when we're working with clients and there's ambivalence or the person is, is wanting to address something, but also um, avoidant or feeling resistant, often working with parts is a really, really helpful approach. So that's certainly a very popular one as well. Um, so there's a range of different ways in which EMDR can be um, utilised across a, a number of different clinical populations. And I think that's probably the most helpful thing to really stress at this point is it's not just for PTSD. People often think, well, I can only apply EMDR in my practice if I'm working with, say, military veterans or sexual assault survivors. And indeed, you can use it with those, uh, with those groups of clients, but there's just so many ways that it can be utilised. Really, if someone's had adverse or painful life events that have not been resolved and are continuing to have a legacy in the present and affect the way they think, feel and act, then that, that's um, often applicable um, for EMDR. So, so those on-demand trainings are available for, for purchase on my website and, and folk get um, lifetime access to the recording um, for those trainings. So you can actually watch them repeatedly over time just to really consolidate and upskill over time. As you were um, talking, I was picturing some of the uh, the listeners feeling a little overwhelmed of like what's between parts and PT, like, you know, they're really starting off in their journey, um, maybe in just general social work or um, trying to build up some skills in working in mental health. What advice um, would you give them around not finding this too intimidating and if they want to get more into working in mental health and doesn't necessarily mean in a counselling role, but how can they not feel the overwhelm and start to build up these skills? Just, I mean, we all had to learn them at some point. We started off uh, new and fresh. Um, do you have any advice for them? Yeah, look, I, I, I think you're right. And I think that I've been working in the trauma space for so long that these things just roll off the tongue. But I look back and <laughs> think about, you know, 15 or so years ago when I was starting out as a social worker, um, gosh, they, these things just didn't even come over, come across my, my, my radar. Look, I think things like um, just building um, a, an awareness of basic um, what we call neurobiology, which in and of itself sounds like a big phrase, but just how trauma impacts the brain and the body. I think even just things like Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score, which is a book that clients often really benefit from, just really understanding the impact that trauma has on a person. That I think is absolutely relevant for all humans, um, let alone if you're working in the trauma field or not, but just that understanding of the fact that trauma is a very important thing to be aware of when we're working really in any helping profession, that a person's behaviour in the present and the way that they feel and, and think is often linked to experiences that they've had in their life that have really not been resolved by that person's brain and body. So I think basic trauma knowledge on that front, so that's a great book. Um, the EMDR podcast, Notice That, is a really great way just to get familiar with EMDR and how this sort of thing works. The Blue Knot Foundation certainly have some really useful training as well around mm. working with trauma. So I think for me, it would really, I mean, beyond basic micro counselling skills, which of course can be done through a range of different courses and, and university settings. But um, I think in terms of stepping into the trauma field, I think the things I've described might be some good places to start. Yeah, I think they're really great. I remember doing some of Blue Knot's training um, and that was excellent. And I'd add to that the book, What Happened to You by um, Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey. It's a very digestible, um, it's a recent book. I think it only came out last year. Um, so what I'm hearing you say as well is you can take it slow. And if you're working with trauma, you're not going to work with the most complex disassociated presentation to start with. You might be working through some of those little T traumas to start with. And even if you're not treating the trauma, you can be very clear with the person and just talk about your limitations and say, I, I know that this has been part of your history and I'll, I'll make sure that my work is informed by that experience 
I'm not equipped to, to, to help you process that right now. Or, you know, our service is limited to six sessions or it's a short-term service. So I'll keep that in mind, but this is what you're presenting concern. And you can actually negotiate those things when you're talking with a client about their expectations and their goals. So people don't feel like if I, if I take on one person who, with trauma, I have to do this whole thing and I'm, not, I'm ill-equipped, like it can, it can be gradual. It can be absolutely, and I think a lot of it's just about holding, um, holding space in a non-judgmental and a compassionate way, emphasizing things like the client's right to have a choice around what happens. So emphasizing that that sort of choice and safety, um, really taking the time to build rapport with a person, not assuming that the person is going to feel safe and comfortable the minute you sit down. Are things like grounding skills and and really just what we consider to be fairly basic foundational things in trauma therapy. But this is the type of thing. That that really anybody can be using with their clients. So I think a lot of it actually is about the basics as much as it is about that more advanced stuff that comes later. Wonderful. And I think we've covered quite a lot about EMDR. What do you do when you're not EMDRing, when you're not helping others, when you're not training, when you're not being a practice owner? Um, yeah, what do you do? I don't do as much as I'd like, actually. I do tend to work more than I than I probably <gasps> tisk tisk. Uh, I know. <laughs> I know. However, I do have a brand new puppy in my life. And so she's keeping me very busy. I adore animals. So that's certainly something that I can say is, is, is a part of my DNA. I'm actually planning to train her as an animal assisted therapy dog. So that's going to be a beautiful way to integrate my love of animals with my therapeutic work and my vocation. I'm also very fond of a good old succulent. I've gotten very fond of that. <laughs> so, so I'm really enjoying getting into the garden and finding that's a very a mindful practice, but also just a you know, I just love nature. I love having nature around me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to live um, in an, an area where there is, um, you know, parklands and a creek nearby. So I do enjoy getting out. I must say it's a bit brisk at the moment in Melbourne. But um, I, uh, I think for me, probably those are the main things. And just a lot of good food, being around my family and friends. It's not been an easy couple of years to, to connect with, with people, has it? But, um, but yeah, I, I like to, I like to um, enjoy good food and good company and lots of animals. That's lovely. And when we combine those, that's even better, right? When we have that's good exactly food, good right. company and a couple of furry friends. That's right. Exactly. With a few plants in the background to look at. A lot of the um, the people I, I speak to on the podcast uh, still have quite a significant caseload. So they're working a lot with clients. So they talk about the importance of supervision. As you step more into a director role and a trainer role, what do you have an equivalent of that? Like, I think it's nice for people to hear about what kinds of supports we have. I mean, it's a slightly tangent from what you do when you're not helping others, but I think it's part of that bigger picture of self-care. Absolutely. So look, I, I will always have people that I look to for mentors and for supervision as well, because I, I think that that's just absolutely essential that we are lifelong learners. So most of the mentoring and, and professional consultation that I get these days is actually more in the space of, of, of leadership and, and business development because that's really the primary work that I'm doing these days however I do see clients one evening a week still and so I also have peer supervision and there's an international um, MDR trainer that I have the pleasure of having access to supervision from as well. Great, great. so I think um, it's something that always comes up and I really want people to realize that we actually don't have to do this alone and in fact I think that's unethical to be holding all of this so even the most experienced trainer still gets supervision absolutely and I need it just as much as anyone else does wonderful that's been an absolute pleasure today um, we'll put links to some of those resources in the show notes and the books that we talked about um, if people want to connect with you tell us what's coming up what's on the calendar of training and um, what can people kind of kind of do to, to stay in touch or connect with you Absolutely. So I would absolutely love the opportunity to, to train new folk in EMDR therapy. So I have my basic EMDR training program on offer. So the first step toward becoming an EMDR therapist is to do what we call part one training. So the way I run that is a three-day live training with a three-hour pre-workshop component. And so I have my, my next one of those coming up in Melbourne in July. 
uh, on July the 22nd to the 24th. I then also have another one in Melbourne on the 21st to the 23rd of October. And I'll also be traveling around Australia in the months ahead as I start to build my training profile and, and deliver training across the, uh, the country. But um, so that's really the first thing that I'd like to, to invite people to have a look at registrations available for those two part one workshops um, on my website. And there is then a part two training that people can do typically a few months after the part one, but you can and indeed you're required to start using EMDR with your clients after part one. So if you complete that part one three day workshop, then immediately you can start using it with your clients. They also provide a lot of supervision and consultation. My one-on-one -on -one appointments are in very high demand. So for the remainder of this year, they're fairly slim pickings from next year onwards. And my calendar is open for next year. I have a lot of availability one-on-one. -on -one. But in the meantime, I do offer a lot of small group consultation for EMDR therapists. So that's certainly something that people can also um, link in with as well. So, and for people that are already trained in EMDR, I also run advanced EMDR webinars. So on a range of topics that then become those on-demand training that you mentioned earlier. So my next one that is coming up live is on the 25th of June uh, on the topic of EMDR therapy for dissociative disorders. So that's a three hour live webinar that's on the Saturday, the 25th of June and registration is open for that one. The early bird actually expires shortly uh, for that one. And uh, that will then become an on-demand training as well. So it's available for purchase later. Yeah, I think this will be released after that. So if you're interested, catch it on demand. I was just thinking as I was saying that, I was thinking to myself, that's probably the case. So indeed, actually, by the time this goes to air, that will be an on-demand training that will be available. Excellent. And we'll put all of that information in the show notes. And I am so impressed we got through the interview without dogs barking. Without any ruckus. We've both got our dogs sleeping near our feet. We both have dogs. Mine's a 12 and a half week old. So I'm actually particularly pleased that she has uh, maintained uh, the composure that I'd hoped for this uh, conversation. Mine's a grumpy old man. So he's, uh, he's quite content under there near the heater. <laughs> Thanks so much for this, Caroline. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast episode. The Inside Social Podcast would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we record this podcast today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support the podcast, you could leave a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever it is you get your podcast and feel free to join the Facebook group. It'd be great to hear from you. Have a lovely day. Bye.